Welcome back to 20 Games in 30 Days, and today I am playing a classic game. This is one of the early platformers by Nintendo. Oh, you know what? I probably shouldn't say their name. This is the kind of crotchety old man of the games industry. They love to copyright strike people, so we're just going to avoid invoking their name at any point during this video. But you know what game this is. It was made 100% from scratch, and I am quite excited to show, because uh, not only did I do the game art and programming, but also the music was from scratch. This is my first time ever composing a song. One thing I do enjoy doing is starting these challenges with a one hour challenge. So I'm going to do that for this game. I'm going to start with the art. I'm going to try to make a tile set and then I am going to try to create a small part of the world and do all that within a single hour. So this is a essentially a incredibly fast game jam within this larger kind of game jam type game. And it's just a good way I find to jumpstart this, although I will have to come back and, you know, update this art and update some of the other bits. But it's a nice way to kind of speed run getting up and running on a game. So I do that, uh, tile, art's done, here's a tile set, I'm gonna draw that world, and then I will be making the protagonist move a bit. And this movement controller is a little bit clunky, but I actually found that on the original game, the movement was also a little bit clunky compared to something like I recently was playing Celeste. And if precision platformers have come a long way, so it's quite interesting comparing a very old game compared to a very modern one from that perspective. And then uh, the final thing I have time for within this first hour is to get a camera that can scroll and follow your player and add moving enemies, but they don't actually hurt you yet. So that's about all I managed to get done, but uh, quite happy with that progress anyways. And then we'll be going back and making the art a little bit more final after this. So the way I ended up doing this camera is to have a couple of trigger volumes on it. On the back, there is actually a collider that prevents the player from walking out of the screen. It's a physical wall that only the player collides with. Everything else will pass through. But on the other side, there is a trigger volume, and so that will actually detect when the player enters it, and it will then tell the camera to move to player position plus a offset. And that's just one way to do it. There are many ways you could do it, but I think some of these decisions are interesting to think of what did I come up with when I wasn't Googling for answers and I was just kind of trying to figure something out? So now I'm going to actually do the art and I ended up deciding that this is final. So this is going to be a big art session and I will have my soundtrack running in the background and I'm going to cut out a whole bunch of this, but I'll be tapping back and forth between editing my song and editing the art and... Uh, yeah, so here we go with a large session of playing with sprites. And creating a world from those sprites, of course. All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to keep this simple, and I thought that two voices would give enough variety, but it turns out the song really didn't work until I ended up adding a third retro synth. And so now they have a fair bit more variety, and not just subtle variations, but fairly dramatic deviation from the kind of main tune, which, listening to the original soundtrack, is the same thing that they did. The overworld theme had a lot more subtle variations than I remember, but it also had kind of chapters and verses. And the part that sticks into your head that you remember from that song is supported by all the other parts that you typically forget. 
And so I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting in lots of little bits here and there that give you a break from the main theme, but make that main theme stand out and become, I think, even more memorable than if it's just burrowing into your head and you just want it to stop. <laughs> so that is my non-musician take on how that all worked, but I'm overall quite proud of my attempt at recreating a theme song that is loosely based on the overworld theme. Okay, that's a world completed, and it's looking good, but I think I want to do a little more art, so I'm going to keep working on the bricks and blocks in particular. Actually, I think everything. Bricks, blocks, and warp pipes. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little more of that, but hey, that flagpole is looking good. I find it interesting when working with blocks this small, just how, I guess, easy it is to make the exact same artistic choices that were made on the original game even without looking at it at the same time uh, every now and then i'll tab back and forth and realize that i recreated the art almost exactly as it was uh, simply because there's not like for these bricks there's not a lot of different ways to make a brick so i actually have to be a little bit careful about that but it's just interesting thinking about how that works with uh, some of this video game art for very low resolution, there just aren't always a ton of different ways to make something. So I had to go back a few times just to make sure that my art was original enough to not be entirely derivative. And if you see me remaking something a couple times, that might be why if I tab over and realize it is just way too close to the original. Here's another moment where I was trying to do something a little bit more unique and artistic. I thought it might be fun, instead of a question mark on this block, to do an interrobang, which is a question mark and an exclamation point together. Unfortunately, I could not get that to work. So I tried an arrow, and that also kind of looked bad. I don't want to do a question mark. In the end, I decided to just go with a exclamation point instead, and I think it works. This castle was quite fun. This was one of the other places where I did kind of inject a lot of my own creativity into. So this is not uh, just the castle that they had. I ended up adding a few more turrets and spires. So it was quite a bit larger.
I'm doing a lot of work and rework here, but I think it is worth the effort. It looks pretty good in the end. I did do multiple layers just so I can move in front of and behind different parts of the castle later on. And also that allows them to stack. So some tile sets are in front of other tile sets here, particularly near the top. There we go. I have a lot more turrets and spires than the original did. <laughs> Take a visit and... Oh yeah, that's nice. I think that was worth the extra time. Okay, oh, last thing I need... Fix that. And with that, I think our art is done. So now we have art and a tile set level with one brick that can break, as you saw there. But none of these bricks or item boxes do anything. And so that's going to be our next step, is just replacing all of the tile set elements with actual physical objects that can be interacted with, and then erasing the tile set. And first thing I noticed, player doesn't really interact with the bricks very well. When there are multiple in a row, he can't squeeze into that gap. So I'm going to change the shape of the collider. That was, I guess, kind of a hacky fix, but it did work. And then once that's done, the next step is going to be to ensure that I can't break all of the bricks with a single jump. And so I'm adding a little bit of code to enable you to essentially bounce off of the bricks. So when you hit them, you will come back down and it'll also set a flag saying player broke a single brick. You can't break a second brick until you've landed on the ground again. And that just prevents you from breaking two or three or four in a single hop. I did also clone the brick to make the item box. They are separate items, but they do the exact same thing currently. So I will have to add the part where the item box emits an item later. But for now, both of them break. And if you notice, both of them break, even though your character is small. I don't have the mushroom power up implemented yet. So this project has been interesting because it is by far both the easiest and the largest. I would say if there's one game Godot is specifically designed to make for you, it would be this one and probably also Doom in 3D. It wasn't difficult, but I definitely threw together a checklist for all the things I need to get done going forward. And I didn't quite complete everything on the checklist, but I did sort them by priority. So next up, we're going to be adding enemies to the game. Thankfully, I have already created an enemy during that hour of power at the beginning. So we made that its own scene, and then I'm placing them everywhere. I decided to call this one Squishy, and then the uh, one with the shell will be named Shelly. So those are our enemies in this game, are Squishy and Shelly. So yeah, we finished placing Squishy just about everywhere, and then I'm going to want to actually add the part where we can kill him by jumping on his head. And it's interesting. I had a conversation with someone about how this was done in the original game uh, after I had finished my version. It simply checked the direction that your uh, character was moving and would kill the enemy if you're moving down and kill you if you're moving up or staying level. And uh, I ended up doing colliders on their heads versus colliders on their sides. And it may have been easier to do it the other way, but I this was, again, without Googling how to do it, this is the first way that I came up with. And it was just quite interesting finding the unique challenges that came from that. Uh, the colliders were just a nightmare to deal with, and you'll see a running theme going forward of me going back and fixing collision layers time and time again. So that's how I made this, and currently both characters, again, do the same thing, but I will later distinguish them by enabling Shelly to retreat into its shell. So for the movement code, this is very similar to what I've done in a previous game, but I'm using the is on wall check, which will detect if there is a body next to it, and it'll simply turn around. So it walks at a fixed speed and then turns around and goes the other direction. And it looks like that bounces off of me, which is great. Uh, one thing I noticed, though, is if I go too far forwards, uh, all of the enemy is already gone because they are moving even when they're not on camera. So I'm going to add what's called visibility notifier, which will tell me if it's on screen. So it'll be activated when it enters the screen, and then it'll keep moving after that point. So it'll walk off even if you don't see it, but it won't be moving before you see it. So that'll fix that. And then I will copy all this over to Shelly so both characters can move even though they're not yet distinct. And now we're going to add layers and colliders and trigger volumes to the player as well as the enemies for them to be able to detect each other and do all the behaviors that I described earlier. And this should work uh, well and be straightforward and not cause any issues. 
player needs to be layered in here. You know, we'll actually make him layer here. And we'll make him mask here. Hopefully that's not too confusing. I may need to change that. But we're going to give it a shot. Other than breaking the game, that seems to work. Block is layered in here. Oop. That's... Oops. I managed to iron out all the kinks, but I also ended up adding colliders to my notes template for all of my games going forward. So I can think about them early and not have to deal with that another time. Because I think the larger the game, the more difficulty you have trying to just make colliders work if you're winging it. A couple other things I added while I was doing the colliders. The first one is for the item block, I added a second image. So now instead of breaking, that one does turn into an empty item block. And so that's just when you jump and hit it, and if it's a brick, it'll destroy itself. But if it is an item block, it'll change its image and deactivate. And so that we still don't have power-ups coming out of the item blocks, but at least they're doing that. The other thing is scoring, which works for the most part exactly how you'd expect, with the one exception of when you jump on multiple enemies in a row. I actually did program in I added yet another collider for to check when you're on the ground, and if you bounce on more than one enemy before hitting the ground, it actually keeps track of the number, and it will chain them together. So you get, I think it's 100 points for the first one, 200 for the second, 300 for the third, etc. But if you keep bouncing on them, it'll keep going up until you hit the ground. Now I have a complex behavior I need to specifically program in. When you are walking and you jump and hit a brick from underneath and an enemy is standing on that brick, that enemy should die. Currently, the brick breaks, enemy falls on your head. My first thought was to add a physical object on top and have it share collision with the player. So when the enemy is in the kill box and that collider turns on, the enemy will think that a player jumped on his head. Turns out that is not how colliders work. If you turn them on, it won't count as overlapping. So I had to abandon that. So plan B was to check using an area when an enemy entered the box and keep track of if it is currently above or not. And if you jump and hit the box or brick, it will kill the enemy. This only works though with one enemy in the box, I realized. So I did a little more Googling and it turns out I don't actually need to do this. There is a way that these areas are already tracking and you can get all active coll collisions, which is what I really wanted in the first place. When we run it, it looks like everything is working. So a long list of things I could do next, but I decided to add coins in and I drew them, but then decided to just use an animation player. And if you use the uh, Bezier curves, they will be able to kind of jump up and down. So I'm not using gravity or physics. I'm just using those curves. <clears throat> I have a coin simply spawn behind the item box when you hit the box, and then it'll pop up, come down, and then delete itself. You also have a couple hundred points that you'll get every time you hit that box. 
And then I did also create a static coin object that just sits there and can be collected for the same number of points. At first I added the coins just to the tile set. I wasn't sure if I was gonna use them or not, but later on I actually added them for real. Later on, uh, much later when I was actually editing the video, I noticed that something definitely felt missing during this part, and I realized that uh, the coin sound is a lot more iconic than I had initially uh, thought. So I went back and added that. I um, just used one bit dragon again, and I just way turned up the uh, beats per minute, but made just a little sound that is using the same synths that I was using for the game music, and that just adds a lot more life, I think, to the coins. So I added this much later in the game, but as we're talking about coins, I thought I'd throw this in here. A few more things I added to the quality of life things. I got the GUI or UI done. So this is a life counter as well as a timer, which is a little bit arbitrary. It counts, I believe, five times per second. The original also did this. It was counting ticks instead of seconds. So I kind of just chose a number and went with it. And then I, with a life counter, I now have a kill brush underneath the map. So when you fall, you will also lose a life. It'll reset you to the beginning of the level. If you fall, uh, it will also, kill brush does remove the enemies from the map as well. And when you hit an enemy, it will also reset you to the beginning of the level. And it does clear out your score. I did later on make sure to change that so you keep your score from previous levels, but not from the current one you're in. So that's dying during the level, but what happens when you win? Well, I decided to address that next. So I am working on the flagpole. And for that, there are a number of things I needed to do. But essentially, I made a collection of trigger volumes at different heights and each one will give you a different score the top one will give you a level up which is similar to how the flagpole worked in the original but you when you hit the flagpole it will start a animation which is a combination of animation player animation and physics based so your character the movement controller is turned off and it simply holds the move right key which will keep you walking uh, towards the castle but there is a collection lighter there that actually blocks you from moving so it's just an invisible wall and it holds you against the flagpole and once the flag reaches the bottom which is an animation then that body will disappear and you move to the castle at which point you will hit a second invisible wall and that one will stop you essentially inside the castle the castle exists on multiple layers, and one of those layers is in front of the player, so it appears that you go into the doorway. And I believe this is actually similar to how the original game worked. But with that, you now have a end-of-level animation sequence, and once you're inside the castle, there is a timer that will count down, and then it will go to the next level. Uh, unfortunately, I never got past having one level, so instead of going to the next, it'll simply reset the current level. At this point, I am essentially done with the game, and I just want to decide what else to add. So I'm ignoring the 20 minutes of me talking into the microphone about why I'm not going to create uh, warp pipes or secrets in the game. I decided that because those were something that you would discover on a repeat playthrough, that it wasn't as important. And then I ended up talking myself into making those. So the next thing I did was Warp Pipe, and that was actually the expensive animation. I never finished that, but I think it was a good choice. It does feel more complete having these things. So the Warp Pipe is, again, fairly straightforward. I used two position 2Ds, which are objects that you can move that essentially just contain a physical location. And then all I have to do with the warp pipe is move the character to one labeled output and then move the camera to the other one labeled camera out. And with those two set up, you walk onto the pipe, press the down key, and it'll jump you there. And then I have a second version that will trick or move you immediately when you enter the volume and won't wait for an input key. So one gets you in, one gets you out. Uh, one other thing with the warp pipe is I realized that this secret room uh, does not work with my camera ratio. I did not respect the original aspect ratio of the game. So I actually move the entire room over. And I also do need to add the real coin object because up until now I was not using the actual object. Uh, luckily I made that earlier, so I just had to throw that in. 
Now I decided it was time to actually animate Shelly, the other enemy in the game. And I say animation, all I did is turn the sprite upside down when you jump on it, which I think worked just fine actually. So that is now animated and then it moves backwards and forwards as it was doing, except just quite a bit faster. And there uh, was even more of the collision layer disaster. So instead of talking more about that, I'll just give you another montage of that lovely little disaster. But uh, hey, again, as before, it did work out in the end. Okay, so it turned out most of the weird behavior came down to a race condition between you hitting the Shelly and Shelly hitting you. So I added a arm function that only enables it to kill you as a shell after you have hit it from the side and started it moving. So it gives you just a little bit of time to get away and for it to be far enough away from you that colliders aren't overlapping and it doesn't trigger as you simultaneously killing each other while it's a shell. So that, I think, fixed the majority of that. It's still not perfect, but it is working better. So at this point, finish line is in sight. I'm trying to figure out what are the final things I want to do. And I decided that it might be actually worth my time to add some background art in. So I made the clouds and the bushes, which, as the original game did, I reused the same texture for those and just change the colors and then I also added the hills in the background and that just gives it a little more personality I think it actually adds a lot more to the game than I was expecting uh, looking back the sky was quite bland without anything there the last thing I decided to do is power-ups and okay actually I didn't have time to do all the power-ups so the last thing I did was create the mushroom and I made the standard mushroom as well as the one-up because they have the same behavior I just changed it where the one-up obviously gives you a new life whereas the standard mushroom makes your character a little larger and so this was a combination of all the things I've done before actually the movement was the character controller I had the animation where it rises up out of the block when you hit it is essentially the same as the coin animation I was a little worried about blending between animation and physics but it turns out the animation overruled everything and when it ended the physics took over so it just it worked perfectly which was great it moves around and when you run into it it disappears and uh, calls a script on your character to either add a life or to make you a little bit larger and then that gives you an extra hit uh, i had to tweak a few things with that uh, particularly falling out of the map i had it reducing your life by one i needed to add it i added a second collider to make sure that you did die when you fell out of the map so now you can be small and large and if i don't have the other power-ups i did draw them but i didn't have time to actually program them but that's okay i think this one's the most iconic and with that we are done so i'm gonna go ahead and play this final game one final time and i did a bit of run break fix i'm skipping but yeah uh, we made it there so uh, thank you so much for watching i am quite happy with how this one turned out it was oh man it was just for being a 24 hour game uh, i think it's actually about 16 hours in total there was certainly a lot to go through and even making this video this is the longest video i've done so far i believe or not time wise but this is the most work i've put into a video i am i'm glad to have done this project and also very glad to be done with it and i will be back next i'm gonna kind of take a break from platformers i'm gonna do another web game called motherload which if you haven't heard of that one it is 
kind of a Minecraft, very simplified. So I'm gonna do procedural generation and mining and a few other things, and that should be fun. And then after that, I will come back and continue where we left off here with Sonic. And that will be it. Thank you for watching, and here is my final playthrough of this game with everything in.